Today's year begins on Davchof Ches Omid Aleph, eight lines from the bottom at the new Mishnah. Before we begin the Mishnah, we glance at the side where we have a, no say, a topic heading, which reads, Machloikis Tanoim, we'll see a Tanaic disagreement, Ad Mosai Beral Yochol Lahofer Nazirus Ishto, until when can a husband annul the Nazirus that his wife accepted on herself? One opinion, Ad Shenizra Kadam, until the blood of the sacrifices that she brings at the end of her Nazirus until the blood application to the altar. And a second opinion, Ad Shritas HaKorban. He can annul it, but only up till the time of the slaughtering of the sacrifice. Now you might ask, wow, this is, you're talking about it, she's already observed her whole, whole Nazirus, she's at the time of bringing the sacrifices. What's the point at all in annulling the vow? So, bear in mind, one uh, practical ramification of an annulment would be that she wouldn't have to shave all of her hair. Of course, a Nazir, when he completes the Nazirus, the Nazir, whether man or woman, has to shave all of their hair. And in effect, you'll have a, let's say, a baldy uh, haircut. Now, the Mishnah. Nizrak Oleho Echod Min Hadomin. Eino Yocho Lahafir. If any one of the three Nazir sacrifices was slaughtered and the blood was sprinkled, at that point the husband can no longer annul her, the wife's Nazirus. We take a look at the Tesfis, Nizrak Lahod Min Hadomin, Kigon, Shigomra Nazirus Betara, she completed her Nazirus in a state of purity, no defilement to the dead, the via Korbanus Nazirus Taro Shein Gimel Behemus, and she brings the three animals that are required as Korbanus, as sacrifices upon the conclusion of her Nazirus, Kivso Lechatus Vekevis Leilu Vayel Shlomim. Kivso is a lamb, female lamb, as a Chatus sin offering, a male uh, sheep as a as an Ola, and when we speak about a kivso or kevis, you realize we're dealing with young animals. That's why the, the term lamb might be used as well. The ayul l'shlamim, that's a two-year-old, sometimes it's called a ram, a two-year-old sheep uh, to be brought as a shlamim, a uh, peace offering. The nizrak ola echod minatomim, and one of these animals was processed as a korban, and its blood applied to the altar as is done with korbanas, chatos, oyoilo, oyoilo, and one of them, whether it's the chatos, or the olo, or the shlomim sacrifice, eno yochlofer nidro, he can no longer undo, annul her vow, le'inyin shelo titzorech legaleach, labisha korbanas, the annulment would have resulted in her not needing to take the haircut, or not need to bring the other sacrifices. The lefisha ain't kan inu nefesh, the Biyayin Muteris, at this point <coughs> that one of the uh, sacrifices was uh, Nizrak Doma, the blood applied, there's no longer any constrictions on her that result in, we'll say, uh, uh, deprivation. Why? Because once the blood is sprinkled, she's allowed to drink wine. And that would have been the grounds or the reason for allowing the husband to annul the vow was so that she doesn't have to endure the Inui Nefesh, the restriction. But when you reach this point that the blood of one of them was sprinkled, she can now drink the wine. So there's no grounds for, uh, for allowing the husband uh, to annul the vow. And if you will argue what's still, let him annul the vow in order to... Um, prevent her or enable her to avoid the total haircut, which would then make her look ugly. And as Teresa says, Venim eses ole isha mezgalachas, and that might be termed a uh, uh, disgusting, uh, re- uh, reviling to have a shaven wife. That's not the case, though. She can wear a wig. A wig. The Gemara will explain thusly. If no blood has been sprinkled yet, 
she is restricted from wine. Mikri Shapir Inu Inefesh, she is described then as enduring suffering. Afagav Delo Mitzra Elo Shaita Porta, even though we're talking about a very short time frame. But the, we'll say conceptually, the mere fact that she is prohibited, forbidden to drink wine, she's categorized as in, enduring Inu Inefesh, and hence the husband would have a right to annul. He has a reason, a good reason to annul the vow. Now we turn back to the Gemara. Rabbi Kiva Omer, he says that the husband's right to annul stops even earlier. Even if there was the mere slaughter without the blood application, he can no longer annul the vow. Notice we've dashed underline key words, the word Nizrak, the line before, and the word Nishchata, in order for you to see the contrast between the two opinions. Bamed Vamurim, under what circumstances we say that the husband cannot be mafir, cannot annul after the sprinkling of the blood. That's when you're talking about the end of a properly observed Nazirus period. Tiglachas is the, the haircut that takes place at the end of a of a, a tara, meaning a, a properly observed Nazirus without any defilement, a pure Nazirus. Avobitiglachas if you're dealing with the need for taking a haircut as a result of the nausea becoming tome, so what do we have? We have a woman that accepted Nazirus and observed a, a, a number of days of the Nazirus, and in the interim, she became defiled. As a result of the defilement, she has to wait seven days of purification, at the end of which she takes the required haircut as a result of the Tumah, and then restarts the Nazirus all over again. If that is uh, what has happened, then Yofer, the, uh, the husband, can annul the vow, even if the blood of the uh, Korban was sprinkled, and we didn't mention, we've learned this in the past quite a bit, and that is that when a Nazir becomes defiled, they bring three korbonas. They bring a chatas, osham, and an ola. And if the blood of one of those korban tuma uh, was applied, doesn't can still be mefer. Shu yocholomar, because at that point the husband can say, i efshi be'isha minuveles. I cannot uh, continue living with a woman that is minuveles. Now, the word minuveles is in our context a, a, associated with wine restricted, with a wine restricted woman. And therefore, since I cannot live with a wine restricted wife, he, the husband is, is able to mayfer the netter, even though one of the korbanas has been uh, sprinkled. If you recall, before we said that when the sprinkling of the blood takes place, at that point the woman is allowed to drink wine, that is true when you're dealing with the sprinkling of the Korbanus of Nazirus Tara, at the conclusion of the Nazirus. So here we're not anywhere near the conclusion of the Nazirus. If anything, she has to start all over again. So being that that's the case, the husband says, I can't continue with a wife that is restricted from wine. Hence, he has legitimate grounds for annulling the Nazirus even though uh, the blood of one of the sacrifices of the Nazirus Tuma has been applied. Rebbe, Oimer, Av Pediglachas Hataro, Yofer. Even when it comes to the issue of the haircut that's required, at the end of a properly observed Nazirus, the husband can undo the Nazirus vow of his wife. Even though you're dealing with a point in time where she's observed her entire Nazirus and even offered a sacrifice. Why is he still able to be Mayfair, even though she's allowed to drink wine at this point? But nay, the reason is Shehuyocholomar, the husband, can say I cannot live with a woman, with a wife that is shaved bald. We now continue with the Gemara. Masnisen delo kerebeliyazer. Our Mishnah is not in accordance with the Tanaic viewpoint of Rebbe Eliezer. The Rebbe Eliezer 
Ha'omar tiglachas me'akeves, the haircut is a restrictor of wine, meaning that until the haircut is taken, she can still not drink wine. Meaning, even though a sacrifice of the Nazir's Tara, one of the sacrifices was slaughtered and the blood sprinkled, she still cannot drink wine, according to Rebelezer. She would have to take the haircut. So as long as she hasn't taken the haircut yet, you have a woman who's restricted from wine consumption. The cave on the low gilcha, asira b'chamra, and since she hasn't as yet taken the haircut, she is restricted from wine. The cave on the is law nivel, and since she is categorized as nivel, once again, we're not translating the word, but we're saying nivel means she is a wine restricted individual. Motsi mefer, the husband is able; he can he can annul the vow, even though all of the korban. Uh, Corbonus blood has been sprinkled on the Mizbeach. That is Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, and his opinion is not reflected in the Mishnah. We continue at the top of Omid Beis. Tana Didan Savar, our Tana holds the, that means the Tana Kama. Shortly we'll present uh, Rabbi Akiva. Our Tana holds Savar, Kevan the Izdirik Allah Dam. Once the blood has been applied of one korban, la altishai b'chamra, she's immediately allowed to uh, consume wine. Feha less law evil, and there's no longer the evil status upon her, and hence the husband cannot annul her nazirus vow. Rabbi Kiva Sovar, afilu ish techitas behema eno yochel hafer. Rabbi Kiva holds that even if one of the animals was slaughtered without the blood yet being applied, the husband can no longer be mefer, and the Nazirus procedure must continue as Nazirus sacrifices. Why? Mishum hefsid kotchim. Because otherwise, you'll have a loss vis a vis korbanus. You'll have slaughtered a sacrifice. And imagine, if the, if the vow would be annulled at this point, there would be no uh, reason to continue, and a korban cannot be eaten unless the blood is sprinkled. So if he annuls the vow at this point, everything would stop. And uh, Rashi says on the third line from the top, Eino yochel lehofer, mishum bizoyon kochim. Rashi has an expression, bizoyon kochim, our Gemara used the word, hefsid kochim. And Rashi says, tohoyl v'in ha-bailim miskapim, both since the owner isn't achieving uh, purpose or atonement through it, if the, if the vow has been annulled, so there's no, there's no purpose in the sacrifice, ein ha-bosr nechal, the, the, the meat would not be eaten. The Tosfos at the top says, "Mishum hefsid kachim shim yofer law kaidim zrika." If the husband were to annul the vow before the sprinkling of the blood, v'shuv einot zrika lekorbanos halolu. Well, and at that point she wouldn't need the sacrifices anymore. The also lizrok dam, and as a result of that, it would be prohibited to sprinkle the blood. And we mentioned before that a korban is supposed to come and meet. A korban is not allowed to be consumed unless. The blood has also been sprinkled on the altar. The Gemara asks. The Gemara asks on this last point, this idea of uh, stopping the the nazirus at the point of the slaughtered sacrifice before the sprinkling of the blood. Is there really a kachim loss? Notice we have a long question marking. Maskif law Rabbi Zera. Ve'amai, why does Rabbi Kiva claim that there would be hefsid kachim? Lizrok domon shalo lishmon v'yatir basar b'achila. Allow the blood to be sprinkled. Now, lo lishmon would mean with an intention other than the purpose for which the korban is designed. Lishmon means for its design purpose. The korban was set aside as a nazir korban, but in the event of the Nazirus being annulled, so you have korbanos that are not, they're not there anymore for Nazirus purposes. So the Stam Zrika, even it's a, 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 an undefined 
a mechanical zrika that one would do without any specific intention, it would be considered shalol uh, Since the korban, as we said, is not omade anymore, it's not there for Nazira's purposes, the sprinkling would be done without Nazirus in mind. And that we call lolishma. And even a zrika that's done lolishma, the bachila, the meat would be allowed to be eaten. Mi lo tanya, do we not have the following teaching? Kivsei atzeres, sheshachton sheloi lishmon. Uh, Kivsei atzeres are sheep that are brought as a korban shlomim on the holiday of Shavuos. If they were slaughtered without proper intention, in other words, they were slaughtered with something other uh, than Shavuos korban, in, with the Shavuos korban in mind. Or they were slaughtered before the time or after the time. In other words, they weren't slaughtered on Shavuos, uh, which is the day for their being slaughtered. Hadam Yizrak Vabosor Yeochel. The blood is sprinkled and the meat is consumed. Ve'im Hoys Shabbos Lo Yizrok. If it's Shabbos, then. There, you don't you don't cook korban meat on Shabbos if it's uh, if it's a korban that's in processed improperly. So if you have a case of a kipsi atzeres or a shalolishmon, you wouldn't roast it on Shabbos. Uh, so don't sprinkle the blood. The imzarak, and if you did sprinkle the blood, hurtza lahaktu emurim If the sprinkling is effective, thereby enabling the innards of the korban to be offered at night, Saturday night, after Shabbos is over. So what do we see over here? We see that even though the korban has been shechted, and the, let us say, the vow would have been annulled, so you're saying that the animals are no longer necessary as a nozir, as a nozir sacrifices, nevertheless, sprinkle the blood, the sprinkling would be considered a zrika shelo lishmon, and a zrika shelo lishmon results in your ability to eat the meat. The uh, toysus that we started on the top, um, we'll do the toysus again, but this time to complete it. Mishum hefsid kot shimi ofer la kodim zrika shuvein at zrika le korbonus halalu v'yosir lizrok dam and the Gemara asks, why is there a loss? Yofer law, let the husband annul the woman's vow, and then the blood will be sprinkled in this shalolishmo fashion, and the meat will be allowed to be eaten. Kedin zvachim shalolishmon, as the halacha says regarding, in general, sacrifices that are processed, shalolishmon, uh, without the proper intention. They came in the Hefer law, once the husband annuls her, her, the wife's vow, the Eina Oid Nazira, and she's no longer a Nazira, Shuv Eina Oid Lishmon, the animals are no longer then there for Nazira's purposes. There's no more Nazira over here. The Afilu Yizrok Domon Stam, and even if the blood is sprinkled without any defined intention, Sherim, the Korbonus are acceptable. They're not. Uh, they're not a total loss. The stamo shalol lishmon kaimi. At this point, they are there for their for some purpose other than their original design purpose. Vochi komar yizrok domoi. The stamo shalol lishmon kaimi. Elo l'shem shalmei nedava. The korbonos, if you don't have any specific intention, will we'll say that they are no worse than voluntary shlomim sacrifices. Came into eino eino zero. Since she's no longer in Nazira, that would be the result. So why is there this claim that there's Hefsid Kutchim? The Gemara answers, Amri, we answer, If Rabbi Kiva in the Mishnah had been addressing a case of an Ola or Shlomim sacrifice that had been slaughtered, not yet uh, have the blood, blood sprinkled, that was our only consideration, then we would say, go ahead, let the husband be mafer, let him uh, annul the vow, and uh, there would be no kachim loss. And the askinon, the point that Rabbi Kiva in the Mishnah was addressing, which said that the 
annulment power stops at the point of shechita, kigon shishochat chatos beresha. It's a, it's a situation where the chatos was slaughtered first. And with regard to a sin offering, the laws and the rules and standards are different. In the case of a korban chatos, a sin offering that's slaughtered, shalol ishma, it is a ruined korban. It is posel. It's not a kosher korban. And in such a case, where the chatos was slaughtered, uh, as the first sacrifice, the husband, if he's going to annul after the slaughtering, before the sprinkling of the of the blood, the korban chatos would have to be thrown out. And therefore, we preempt that by saying, if the chatos was the uh, first korban, and it was slaughtered, was the first one that she decided to bring, and it was slaughtered, at that point, the husband cannot be mefir, cannot annul the vow anymore. As the Gemara continues, uh, it addresses an, an issue that we would we understood in the last two lines of Gemara. We understood between the lines, so to speak, mean, meaning that the order of offering the three sacrifices is not, let's say, predetermined. It's not established. Rather, one has an option to offer whichever korban they want, and if let us say, a shlomim was the first one she chose to bring, and it was slaughtered, and the blood not yet sprinkled, we could say, let the husband annul, and the uh, shlomim would still be kosher, would be no loss to the shlomim, because the blood could be sprinkled, uh, shalom lishma. Likewise with the ola, which is a, a sacrifice that's totally burnt on the mizbeach, anyway, it would still be an olas nedava, and no problem. So, in saying what we just said, the choice of which korban is to be brought first is up to the individual nazir. So, where do we know that from? Kedisnan, as is taught in the following Tanaic source. Im gilach al achas mishloshton yotza. Notice the Mishnah says if one cut their hair after any one of the sacrifices, they have fulfilled their requirement, their haircut requirement, what then do we see? That the order is not something uh, that is uh, legislated, but rather any one of them could be the first one chosen. Here we quote from the Mishnah, we said, when is it that the husband can no longer be mefer if there was a blood sprinkling already? That's when we're talking about the sprinkling of the blood of the sacrifices at the end of a properly observed Nazirus. But if you're talking about the sacrifices brought at the end of a Tuma period, where at the end of a Nazir that became Tome, at the end of seven days of purification, they have to take a haircut and then start their Nazirus counting all over again. So the Tanakama says that the husband can be made for even if one of the korbanas were sprinkled as well. Rabbi Meir said that even at the end of the properly observed tuma, uh, t- uh, Naziris period where there was no Tuma and the bl- uh, blood of even one of, a, one of the korbanas was sprinkled, the husband can still annul the Nazirus. Why? Because if he doesn't do so, uh, she's going to have to take the required uh, bald haircut. And the husband can say, I can't live with a wife whose, whose hair is shaven bald. Now, the Tanakama doesn't seem to be concerned with that. The Tanakama Omar Loch, I'm sure Bepeo Nochris Tanakama, who said that the Nazirus annulment rights of a husband at the end of Nazirus Tara end with the sprinkling of the blood of one korban simply because at that point there's no more nevel, ah, she still has to take the haircut, that is not going to be a point of concern to a husband because the the wife can wear a peyonochris, a wig. The term peyonochris literally would mean the hair of a, let's say, a strange or a foreign woman. In other words, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wig that's made of someone else's hair. So it's a wig, and the husband 
doesn't have any grounds of let's say objection that she is a a wife whose hair is shaven bald. Let her put on the wig. Rabbi Meir Savar, Rabbi Meir, who said that the shaving is still a consideration that enables the husband to annul prior to the shaving. And through the annulment, so then we say that there's no more shaving of the head required. And the, what about the wig thing? Rabbi Meir holds, the peyanokris, aidi de zuama lo nichole. We're going to uh, look at the rush uh, where there's a star at the lower part of the page in the rush commentary. For Bimeir Sovar de Mezuham Bi'ene Habal. Mezuham is a word in, in, associated with that which is uh, revolting, disgusting. It's, this is disgusting in the husband's eyes. Shetitain Ishta Arosha Seor Isha Nachris. That uh, a wife would put on her head the hairs of some other woman. That itself is revolting to the husband, and therefore that's grounds enough for him to still annul, even though the uh, blood of a of the cor- final korbanos, even the blood of one of the korbanos, was already sprinkled. The Mishnah, Hoish Madir as Beno Benozir. Here we have a a very um, interesting idea, something that is unique to Nazirus. And that is that a, a, a man, a husband, I saw a father, has the right to impose Nazirus on his son. This is a point that we've seen before, uh, but quite a while before, and, hence, and here we have it uh, as the focus of the sukya. The Mishnah goes on to say, V'ein ho'isha maderes es benazir. A mother does not have that power. So now we have a case of a child upon whom Nazirus was imposed by the father. Gilach uh, el Krovov. If within the Nazirus period he shaved his head or his relatives shaved his head. Micha el Shemichu Krovov. Or the child protested uh, or the relatives protested. Hoy solo behema mufreshes. With this having taken place, with this, with a, the demonstrated objection to the Nazirus through through the relatives shaving the uh, the child's head in the uh, in the uh, giving him a haircut in the middle of his Nazirus, or the relatives or the child protesting it. What's the result of that? So it it in effect cancels the Nazirus. It undoes the Nazirus. Well. Uh, if uh, an animal had been set aside for his, uh, we'll say, anticipated sacrifices, and before we got to the sacrifice stage, you have this objection to the child's nazirus. What do we do with the animals? Achatos tomus, the animal set aside to be the sin offering required at the end of a nazirus. It now is not necessary, so it's set aside to die. The oila tikravola, the ola, so it won't be used as a nazirus ola. Nevertheless, it's offered as a nedova, a voluntary ola offering. Vishlamim yikrufu shlamim. Likewise, with regard to the shlamim, they're offered as a shlamim, as a nedova. Venecholim liomechad. They, however, have the restriction of a nazir shlamim, which has only one day for its eating, the day and the night, unlike a standard shlomim that has two days and the intervening night to eat it. The Anon Teunin Lechem. This shlomim of a of aborted Nazirus will not have the 20 loaves that are customary uh, uh, the, for a regular Shalmei Nazir. Hoyulo Mois Stumin Yiplunadova. If money had been set aside but not yet defined, so the money is used to purchase voluntary sacrifices. Mois Mifurashim, if there had been money set aside and defined, that namely uh, earmarking part of the funds for Chatos, part for Ola, part for Shlomim. So Deme Chatos, now that we have this aborted Nazirus, the money earmarked for the Chatos, Yechu Liam Hamelach, will be brought to the Dead Sea. The, to the salt sea where it will decompose. 
One is not to benefit from those monies, but if one does, they're not going to be guilty of of mi'ila. You're dealing here with what we call uh, monies that could not be used, that cannot be used anymore for sacrificial purposes. Therefore, the mi'ila sin that's associated with benefiting from uh, items that have been sanctified doesn't apply. The money that was earmarked for Ola purposes is used to buy an Ola umal and and is subject to the Mi'ila sin if one derives personal benefit from these monies these monies have been set aside for the purpose of buying an Ola which has a Kotche Kotchem status to them hence they are subject to the Mi'ila sin uh, upon uh, uh, deriving personal benefit from it Demei Shlomim the money that was earmarked for shlomim purposes is used to purchase shlomim sacrifices. They, uh, like we saw before, the shlomim in this case will be eaten only uh, with a one-day time limit and do not have the customary loaves brought with them. The Gemara uh, investigates the opening of the mission that said only a father as opposed to a mother has the right to impose Nazirus on the child. Now, on the side of the moral we have an say a topic heading at which in which we've written Shnei Shitois Loma Rako Ish Madir Ez Benoi Velo Isha. Why is it that only a father can impose Nazirus on the son and not the mother? The Gemara. Ish in Aval Isha Lo from the Mishnah we saw quite clearly that only a father has the right and not a mother. My time, why this uh, seeming uh, discrimination? Rabbi Yochanan Amar Halacha He Ben Azir. Rabbi Yochanan says this is an oral tradition. It was what's say was it transmitted as an oral tradition and uh, without any uh, reason, let's say, built into the oral tradition. So we don't have a reason. We just have it as a transmission from Mount Sinai. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina, Omar Reish Lakish, were at the top of Chof Tesom and Aleph, Kedei Lechanchoi B'Mitzvahs. The reason for the Mishnah enabling a father to impose the Zerus on the son is in order to have the child educated in mitzvahs. And amongst mitzvahs of the Torah, there is this concept of the Zerus. So, let the child learn mitzvahs. The Gemara says, "Well, he hafi hafi lo yishanami." Well, uh, if it's a question of educating a child in mitzvahs, why not the mother too? Answer: Kosovar ish chayev lechanech beno b'mitzvahs vein no isha chayevus lechanech es beno. Reish Lakish is of the opinion that it is the father's obligation to educate his son in mitzvah fulfillment. It is not the mother's. Obligation: A mother, a woman, is not obligated to educate her son. At this point, we've concluded our Daf Chavches Daf Yomi quota. Mirz Hashem, in the next year, we'll be able to continue from this point where the Gemara raises uh, questions, presents a series of arguments in favor of Rabbi Yochanan. You can see the triangles are all pointing in the same direction and on the side of our Gemara under the Mivne heading. You can see that these are all Bishlam or Rabbi Yochanan. They're all questions that are, that they're all points that are uh, understandable if you accept Rabbi Yochanan, but difficult with regard to the opinion taken by Reish Lakish. How does Reish Lakish deal with each one of these points? That is the subject of the Gemara Amir Tzashem will get to that in our next shiur. With that, we conclude our shiur for today.